Hello. A warm word of welcome to you from the link charges of St. Michael's, Dallas, Rafford and St. Leonard's in Forest, Scotland. It is my sincere hope and my prayer that you will be blessed in a very special way as we worship the Lord together through this platform what I call the internet. May you be blessed wherever you are and experience the power of God's Holy Spirit. Let us make use of our privilege as believers to sing the praises of our Lord by singing our first hymn, hymn 510, Jesus Calls Us. Another wonderful privilege that we have as believers is the privilege we have to talk to God. I want to invite you now to pray with me our prayers of adoration and of confession. Let us pray. Almighty God and Heavenly Father, how wonderful to see the works of your hands. Thank you so much for all the beauty that surrounds us wherever we are. You are indeed the God of small things, as you care for all living things on this planet. We are encouraged by that fact, because we know that you care for us as well, much more than we ever could even imagine. Dear Lord, in so many ways, however, we have veered from your ways. Therefore, we pray that you will forgive us all our sins, even the ones that we are not even aware of at this moment and time. Thank you for Jesus and for the fact that he died for us on that cross. But thank you also for the fact that he was resurrected and that He reigns forever, and that He prays for us and intercedes for us. Thank You for the love of Christ that we can experience. Thank You for Your Spirit that guides and protects us. All this and many other thoughts and prayers we bring to You in that glorious name of our friend and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 
We read from the Word of God today as we find it in chapter 17 of the book of John. We read from the first verse. Jesus prays to be glorified. After Jesus said this, he looked towards heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave to me. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, you gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine. And glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in this world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one too. Amen. Today we are going to focus on various things during this message. One of those things is prayer, the fact that Jesus prayed for us. But the other thing is unity. Now, unity, it seems, is that elusive description for God's church on earth. We hear the calls for unity, but we disagree on the terms of that said unity. We know that it's part of God's solution for what ails humanity, but we cannot even start to understand the way of sacrifice on that road to peace and unity. We rightly identify it as the way that Jesus described it, as part of our witness to the world of the triune God. And even still, we absolutely don't have unity in our churches. Here at the last meal that Jesus had with his disciples, the last moments of peace and normality, if you can call it that, Jesus ends the evening with a lengthy prayer that makes up all of the chapter 17 of John 17. And it's about protecting his beloved beloveds, about his disciples being unified, and about the glorious unity of the Trinity. Now Jesus lifts his eyes up to the heaven and begins this prayer by saying, Father, Father, allowing his disciples to listen in on his prayer for them. A way of, pre of, a way of praying we can still trust Jesus is praying for us as our great mediator. Isn't that a wonderful thought and the realization that Jesus is still praying for you and for me? Now Jesus' prayer points us to the fact that all that has transpired and all that will still transpire is going to be used for the glorification of the Son as well as the Father. The mutual glorifying between the Father and the Son rests squarely on who benefits from that. Now who benefits from that glorification? The answer is simple and clear. It is you. And it is me. We are the beloved of God. We are the ones who have received greatly from eternal life to the leadership of the Son, 
to the gifts of the Holy Spirit who is with us forever and ever. And through all of this, we have been made to know the only true God and ought to be able to discern this true God from all the other counterfeits we find so readily available in this world, even the ones we ourselves in many instances and cases have made. But Jesus is also praying for himself here. Part of his glorification is returning to a way of being in unity with the Trinity that he had before he came or he became incarnate. In verse 5, he prays in the specific words, So now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. Now, though everywhere is home to our King Jesus, it's important for us to remember that he emptied himself. We read that in the book of Philippians chapter 2. He emptied himself and took on at least some of the limits of humanity. Those limits that you and I are so acutely aware of in our own lives as time passes. And when Jesus ascends to heaven, some of those human limits are transformed. This too is part of his whole glorification process. Jesus' desire as part of this glory is that his beloveds on earth are protected so that they might know the sort of unity that exists within God. That is the reason for Jesus' prayer for you and I, that we will experience this wonderful unity of a family of God. In other words, Jesus Christ sees our unity as part of God's unity. Our unity as part of His glory. Now in the best possible sense of the term, Jesus' blaze for glory on earth is our witness to unity. Our unity is His legacy and our unity is His prayer for Himself. Now, when I get discouraged about our ununifying witness to the world, this is what I think about. Remembering that it is Jesus who is praying for our unity and our protection. For the purpose of unity is immensely encouraging, both in how I feel and how I too pray about this. First of all, Jesus is the one who prays this prayer. He is the most trustworthy, faithful witness to the will of God that ever walked on this earth. He prays for the right stuff in the right way. And here he's praying for unity amongst us, his people, and for our, your protection. His example here is just as much a teaching of how to pray as we have in the example of the Lord's Prayer that we are going to pray later together. And we see that Jesus does pray for himself, but in the way of a humble servant who wishes to be a blessing. Now Jesus' prayer for glory is wrapped in the well-being of others and his concern for reputation is only measured by the fruit of the living within the authority and call that God has given him among the people that he has given him. Now secondly, and because of everything in the first point, Jesus' prayer is not empty of power. It's not just idle words that is flowing from his mouth, but it's filled with glorious and wonderful power, the power of God. Jesus is voicing his commitment to the task of unity, to the task of protection and the task of glorification. And he lets us hear him commit to it. 
That is why it's so important that we realize this was a public prayer meant to be heard by others, meant to be heard by you and I today as well. Now, this is the most encouraging part for me. And I look around the Church of Scotland, the churches all over the world, and I'm discouraged by the lack of unity amongst us. And then I remember that God's work is not done yet. It's not over until, as they say, the fat lady has sung. I'm not supposed to say that, but you know what I'm trying to convey. It's not over. God's work is not done yet. Each person of the Trinity wants to see us be unified, and they are actively working to bring this prayer to bear. And so the question becomes, are we? Are we a unity in the plan of God? We know that ultimately we will know and be the answer to Jesus' prayer when He returns and ushers in the new heaven and the new promised earth. But what might happen if we join Jesus and the Spirit in praying for the right kind of protection that leads to true unity of God's body, you and I, here on earth? What if we learned from the way of Christ that unity comes from protecting the vulnerable? Unity comes from seeking the glory of God through humble servitude and sacrifice. Unity comes through knowing the true God and turning away from all the other idols of our time and this world that leads to our divisions. What if you and I kept God's Word? Now, just to end this message, I'd like to share with you a story from a friend of mine that once shared his memories of prayer at his childhood family table. Maybe you are reminded of what happened around your table when you were a child as well, but his prayers that he remembered from his family dinner table, but not for the encouraging reason you might hope to, because he remembers listening to his parents pray out aloud. He and his siblings listened along as they were prayed for to get better grades, to pay more attention, to honor their parents better by trying harder and being better at music practice. You get the idea. Prayers were a place to encourage being better as identified by the adult at the top of the table. Jesus' call to unity is an encouraging prayer for us. And we do need to do better, of course. But this admonishment disguised as prayer isn't the way that Jesus is praying for His disciples. And we can be grateful for that. Because you know what? Jesus has only the best in store for you and I. May that be your truth, and may God be glorified by our unity in Christ. Amen.
Let us pray again our prayers of thanksgiving, our prayers for others, and the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you for your wonderful prayer. Thank you that we know that you are still praying for us. Help us to do your will and, and be a blessing to you. Help us as we attempt to witness your love in this world. Thank you for every opportunity that you give to us to share your will, your word, and your love with the world. And as we pray, we also think of so many people that are struggling at this moment. We think of all the lonely people in our lives, in our midst, but across the world. People that are struggling with the high costs of living, with sadness and illness, people that are waiting for test results on medical tests and all sorts of things. We pray and intercede for the governments of this world, the leaders that has the power to make a positive influence or create a positive influence in people's lives. We pray for all the countries and people of this world that have been affected by war and political instability. Especially today, we pray for the people of Sudan. We pray for the people of Ukraine and Russia. We also pray for our own government as well, especially our king and queen. We pray for your protection on their lives and that you will lead them with the power of your Holy Spirit. Hear us now as we pray that prayer that Jesus taught us himself. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our last hymn that we are going to sing together is hymn 533. Will you come and follow me? Will you come and follow me if I but call your name? Will you go where you don't know and never be the same? Will you let my love be shown? Will you let my name be known? Will you let my life be grown in you and you in me? Will you leave yourself be if I but call your name, will you care for cool and kind and never be the same? Will you risk a hostile stare? Should your life attract or scare? Will you let me answer prayer in you? Let me. 
I just want to thank you now for sharing with me in fellowship. Thank you that you clicked on this link, and thank you that you follow this sermon and this message. May you be a blessing to God, and may wonderful things happen in your life that encourages you to witness the love of Christ. Receive now the blessing of our Lord. May the blessing of God the Father the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you, unify you until that glorious day when our friend and Savior will come again on the clouds. Amen.